Oh, good morning. Look at that. Somebody put the squeeze on these rocks, huh? You see how they all been that foliation right there? They all been compressed laterally, but you can still, if you want to, you know, get a little uh, screwdriver or something in there, split them on the on the bedding plane. A lot of pressure. You know, it looks like the intermediate to high grade metamorphism, which is basically just cooking the rocks. You know, heat and pressure. Who knows what the parent material was? Could have been, I guess it could have been volcanic. Almost looks like a nice. Isn't it nice? Real nice. How many times has that the geology pun been a uh, beaten like a dead horse? And see you fair and also always a stunner when you see it, you're starting to go off. Let's uh, take a little walk up uh, up these rocks, see what's going on. Over there you got ambrosia, another ambrosia. Looks like salsola. Sunflower family over here, you got some nice physalis, you know? Solanaceae, the genus colloquially known as ground cherries, or uh, or golden gooseberries, I guess, if you're uh, shopping in a woke grocery store. Just a nice geologic mishmash. So because of that plane, everything's tilted down, and it makes a nice little shelf for all the other stuff to grow. Want to know something? Do you want to know something nice? I'm not wearing any pants! Okay, anyway, sorry about that. All right, bear with me. Here we go. Okay, so as we get to the top, you know, there's a lot, the plants up here are getting a little bit more heat. Their metabolism is going, you know, a little bit uh, stronger than the stuff down there where it's still cool, you know? But uh, so we got, a, we got a nice xyloriza blooming. Again, it's Asteraceae. Sunflower family. Look at the phyleries, those little bracts. Multiseriate, narrow and multiseriate, occurring in a, 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 a number of series, not just one level. You got a couple in there. Looks like you got two or three. This flower's yellow. Who's in there? Who's a little guy in there? Wonderful aster species in a Mojave. Then over here, we got one of my favorite uh, species of cacti. Echinocactus polycephala. Now I think they might have. Uh, I think they might have put it in a new genus. I think maybe some grad student needed a project to work on. He didn't want to travel too far from home, so he said, "You know, I'll go over there, switch the genus up." You know, I'm, I'm sure he did the uh, molecular work. Everybody does now. It's kind of standard, but I shouldn't knock it. I'm just joking around. You know, that maybe there's a, a good reason for separating this from Echinocactus, which is a, you know a relatively large genus, quite a few species in it. In uh, Mexico, in the United States, you get, of course, a uh, uh, Echinocactus horizontalonius over there in Texas, in uh, northern Mexico. But anyway, they call this cotton top cactus. You can see why those fruits, they got a bunch of, uh, uh, I guess, just a bunch of little trichomes, you know. And very hard to get out. So the seeds probably got to be dispersed. And it's not a juicy fruit either. It's not a, it's not a, it's not like a, the fruits, you know, when they open up are pretty dry. So I'd assume birds go in there, bird beak, maybe a small rodent, and uh, disperse little black uh, poppy seeds. Beautiful cactus though, and it's called polycephalus because obviously poly, many, cephala, head. And you always see them, you get quite a few heads in there. How many you got on this guy? They don't get that tall, but they, they do get a lot of heads on there. Little pink bastards, these are erodiums. Geranium family. You know, most of them tend to be, I think there's two or three uh, invasive species from Europe, and then there's a uh, uh, erodium texanum, which is a native throughout the southwest. Oh, there you go. There's a nice echinocactus. Okay, it's such a beautiful damn plant. Even if it's not blooming, you know, with those pink somewhat recurved spines and of course that blue almost like a like an aquamarine epidermal tissue under the sides right there this one has five heads okay and you can see that would be a nice look it's kind of shimmery and what the shit almost uh, so it got cooked enough it got melted enough for a little bit of a crystal structure to form a little bit of a grain structure not sure if you would call that nice necessarily i'm not sure if it's hard enough to be nice you know, but the interesting thing though is, see, like I said, it fractures on that one plane, 
but then, uh, you know, you hold it up. Uh, so, you know, so laterally it fractures, but then you hold it up, and it just uh, it retains its form. It's pretty, uh, pretty solid and stable. I seen one piece back down, down the other way that was four feet tall. It looked like a damn fence post. And of course, once the talus accumulates, it just makes a nice pavement. You know, you give it a couple thousand years to settle in. You know, it's very pleasant to walk on. Got a nice uh, a bunch of basilaris, nice beaver tail cactus about to go off. See those buds? Incredible flowers on these. When they, when you know, real bangers, real stunners when they go off. Just bright pink, bright pink blooms. You can see, of course. They just got a bunch of glockids. No, no true spines. Though there's another species in uh, in Baja, that not excuse me, not in Baja, over by Bakersfield. It's a subspecies that does have actual true spines of this uh, Opuntia basilaris. And desert tortoises, you could say tortoise. Could I say tortoise if I'm a jackass? I guess so. Desert tortoises love to eat these flower buds. They'll come up, they'll just nod that thing right off. You know, even though it's all covered in spines, they don't care. They'll just go for it. I seen him doing it. I seen him doing it. Yeah, so you know we're about a little bit under 2,000 feet elevation here. Okay, desert's just starting to wake up for the year. Okay, might be a good year too because now we had all this rain and shit. You could see that. Look at how look. It looks like the, somebody came by and polished the rocks. You know, and then, of course that shimmering, that's kind of smooth. Well, the, the word for that is technically vent effect, and it's not even that strong right here. But it does look like polishing, and again, it's just hundreds and thousands of years of uh, micro abrasions by sand, uh, sand particles. You know, it gets Mojave gets real windy, real damn windy. Okay, let's keep walking. I show you this over here. Nice social distancing is what I said. You know, this that's what I'm doing right now. Social. I've been, try, I've been trying to do that for the past couple of years of my life. I love people. As individuals, I love them. They got a lot of potential. They're great. But when you get them together in herds, that's when they do the most heinous shit, you know? That's when they become unthinking. They lose their ability to think critically. They start worrying what other people think of them, you know, trying to impress each other. Horrible shit, okay? I just, I really want to just emphasize that, you know? <laughs> this species has so much potential. But when you get them together in groups, okay, I don't care if it's fucking Disneyland or, uh, you know, it's uh, war and genocide. That's when they do terrible shit. It's, it's really a bad idea. Look at this little punch of Basilaris. Oh, see, these are just opening up. Again, that's because they, they're getting heat over here. They got a little bit more exposure. Look at that cactus flower. Look at all the stamens in there. Look at it. And they got that, how many stigma? How many stigma lobes? So those yellow things that are just covered in, of course, the dusty pollen, those are the uh, the anthers, which are attached to a filament, and uh, together those comprise the stamen. And then that thing in there that looks like a little grabby hand in the center, of course, is the stigma. Looks like it's got quite a few lobes. Each one of those lobes corresponds uh, to a carpal, generally speaking. So uh, you got stigma, style, and then ovary. Together that comp comprises the pistil, which is almost synonymous with the uh, carpal. But anyway, cactus flowers are real weird. They got an undifferentiated perianth, which means they don't have sepals and then petals. They just got tepals because there's not really, a, you know, any difference between them. All kind of just the modified leaves. Look at that pantheon. Nice inferior ovary. So this will, this will, those green things covered in spines, those will become the fruits. See? These will become the fruits once these flowers bud and if they get pollinated, and they do because this is a huge, uh, huge nectar source for all little insects and critters and what the shit. Look at that. This thing, you give it, you give it two weeks, that thing's going to be blowing, it's going to be blowing up. Look at that. Flower, 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 flower. You got fucking 20 flowers on this thing. It's barely two and a half feet wide. This is one of the most remarkable species in the Mojave Desert. Opuntia basilaris, beaver tail cactus, Okay. I can think of a few people I'd like to tie up and slap around with that. Nothing personal, you know, just more of an ideological uh, ideological uh, issue we have together. Ariaganum inflatum, of course, not blooming yet. Oh, no, you're about, just about to bloom. Look at how tiny the flowers are in this fucker. You can barely see them. You got to get your hand lens. Go get your jeweler's loop. 
Huh? You prick? Did you do that yet? I told you to do that about six months ago. You don't listen to me. And here you got that inflated stem. Some people think that's a structural thing. You know, it's hollow on the inside. But structurally, it, it holds up. It's just a way to get that inflorescence, that compound flower, way up above the ground, make it accessible to pollinators. Other people think there was some hoopla about it having CO2 inside there. I don't know. I read the paper a while ago, forgot about it. But uh, either way, it, Ariagonum inflatum is not the only species that does this. Ariagonum inflatum is a perennial. It comes back every year. You know, I've seen other species. There was one I seen in Utah last year that had the same structure. It was a little bit greener, but it was an annual. Completely different species. But if you didn't know, you come up, you know, it's still got the basal leaves, okay? Photosynthetic stem, and it's inflated at the top. You really got to pay attention to those uh, minute differences. Let's go over here. Okay, so during the Pleistocene, uh, things were a lot different in the Mojave. It was a lot more amenable to plant growth and human life. I mean, it's all the plants that have existed. I shouldn't say amenable to plant growth. All the plants that, that grow here, they do fine here. They're adapted to it. They've been through the filter of evolution. They, they perform wonderfully in this, uh, what can be a very uh, uh, unpleasant environment to grow in for many plants, okay? But during the Pleistocene, temperatures were a little bit cooler, okay? It probably got more rain, and the flora looked a lot different too. And this is a good example of it. You could see we got a couple, just the first sunny day right now, last couple days has just been pissing, just raining like hell. This is the first sunny day. All that rain starts to bring back these ancient lakes. The Mojave was filled with lakes 12,000, 13,000 years ago during the Pleistocene. It's probably filled with a lot of scary large mammals too that are now extinct. But the important thing to note is that there were a lot more lakes and there was a lot more moisture and of course that changed what was able to live here and grow here and what, what you're looking at down there is a population of the plant Castilla emorii most of those shrubs are creosote bush that's Luria tridentata but uh, scattered about in there is one of my favorite Mojave Desert shrubs it's uh, Castilla emorii you can see it see it? it's got the blue like right there and there it's a little bit bluer than that creosote bush now, Castilla Moria is in a Cimarubaceae. I think I said that last night. I don't, I don't know if you've seen it. Cimarubaceae, same family as Atlantis altissima, which is called the tree of heaven. It's a real pain in the ass, noxious weed. It kind of smells like piss that grows in, uh, you know, in, in uh, many of the East Coast. It thrives in many of the East Coast cities. Philly, New York, Chicago, okay? My hometown, Chicago. I remember being a little juvenile delinquent, climbing up uh, Atlantis altissima trees to get to the tops of a... Uh, Rooftops of abandoned warehouses and what the shit. And, uh, you know, you'll find that uh, scattered out west, too, at old settlements and homesteads. But it doesn't seem to do as well because we don't get any summer rain. But in places where you get summer rain, it does fine. It was brought over from Asia in the late 1700s. Anyway, without going into that plant too much, this is a plant from the same family. Castillo Moria. Yeah, let's go take a look and check it out. This little snake hole. You get any? I think it's too cold for him yet. They got a Crotalus uh, scutellatus, Mojave Greens. They got uh, they got some specks out here, some speckled rattlesnakes. A oh, Corazanth. Looks like Corazanth regida, Polygonaceae, the buckwheat family. These are buttes. Here's an old one. See that? Real spiky. Yeah, see, you got some annuals coming out. Got some nice Malacotrix glabrata. Got some nice Canactus. Anyway. So again, you got these ancient lakes, and they always come back when you get some rain. They always come back when you get enough rain. But again, 12,000 years ago, the world, there was a lot more lakes down here in the Mojave Desert. You know, and you can still see uh, the depressions where they grow. And you can still see a water line, you know, if a lake is next to like a rock escarpment or a cliff or something, you can still see a water line left over. Let's get a little bit closer. Hey, look, the Hesperocalus angulata is already coming up. Desert lily, though, it's not a lily at all. But it is a monocot, okay? Agave family, agavaceae. You can see why they call it undulata. Look at those damn leaf margins. Ooh. Real bangers when they bloom. Too early yet. Look at the bricks. Look at the, 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 got the nice bricks. Like the bricks. Okay, so here we are on the margins of the ancient lake. You can see the water line's been receding. You can see where it brought all the uh, apparently conejo shit. Looks like they got some donkey shit too. I like donkeys, but they, you know, they could be kind of, uh, kind of, uh, detrimental to the ecology out here, especially since nothing eats them. If you had some, uh, some of those, uh, ancient uh, megafauna still, you know, like a saber-toothed cat, that'd be nice. Good, good for the donkeys, you know? 
keep their their, their populations thin, but they can get the they can get the kind of out of control. All the conejo shit though too, but that's why you got the foxes and rabbits. You know, provided or, excuse me, foxes and coyotes provide an ecological service, keep the rabbit populations down. Too bad the rednecks like to shoot the coyotes, though. Kind of a bummer, eh? So anyway, again, 90% of the time, this lake is bone dry, nothing on it, okay? But it, like I said, it's been raining like hell, it's been pissing, so, uh, you know, you got a little bit more, a uh, little bit more water. It doesn't get too deep, only about three inches deep at the most. You can see all the creosote out there that Larea tried and thought of doing good, you know? This shit is a pain in the ass to walk on, though. But again, another thing, anytime it rains in the Mojave or the Sonoran, does you got to watch out because they got the valley fever, you know, that the saprotrophic fungus that, that can also infect the mammalian uh, lungs, and it does it very well, too. So, you know, but it tends to sporulate after a rain, so you got to watch out. You know, so don't go digging holes and sniffing the ground like a dog. So anyway, against my better judgment, I put some paints on, but uh, this plant, again, is Castilla Moria, this crucifixion thorn. You know, you rarely see it in populations of more than 100 individuals, okay? I think the biggest one is about 2,500 individuals, and it's uh, in the eastern Mojave. Then you got another population down in eastern San Diego County, uh, you know, close to the Imperial County border. That's about 1,000 thousand individuals. But uh, you got some recruitment, too. You got some little seeds. Winter seedlings they actually have leaves, but uh, as they get older, they drop their leaves, and they just photosynthesize through their stems, you know, and the same thing down there, you know, it's mostly creosote bush, which is scattered remnants of uh, Castillo Amoria, I had a crucifixion thorn, how oh, nice ephedra, just scattered uh, remnants of this uh, formerly, I assume, larger population of a crucifixion thorn uh, growing amongst the creosote, but anytime you see it, it's always growing where it can get access to water, at least for part of the year when it does rain, you find it in you know, dry, non-saline lake beds, you know, sometimes along creeks and whatnot. And uh, anyway, here it is. One of my favorite shrubs of the Mojave Desert. Real weird, real cryptic. It's been surmised, like this more, more of a kind of wild guess, that it's a, it's a leftover from relictual populations, formerly larger populations. Uh, and then just kind of, as the climate here has changed over the last however many dozen millennia, in the Mojave Desert gotten a lot drier. Uh, it's just kind of stuck. It's just kind of left over in these relic populations, you know, it, along former uh, former lakes, you know, basically dry lake beds that flood, much like this does after a good rain. Oh yeah, this is dry already. I was out tromping around here last night, you know, looking like a tweaker with a headlamp, you know, fucking around in the bushes. And uh, this was this was all water. Now it's obviously dried up, you know. Any, any water short-lived out here. But uh, here you go. This plant's a male. Remember, they're dioecious, much like cannabis. There's uh, the old flowers. Staminate flowers. You get a couple hermaphrodites, too, in the population, but generally, plants are either male or female. It'd be nice to find a seedling around here. You know, but of course, the further upland you go, away from the, the depression here, the dry lake bed, the less plants there are. Look at this, you can see, uh, see that new growth? See how it's kind of red? The ends of those uh, shoots are red. And it tells you they're growing. You know, got to protect that new soft tissue before it hardens off. Oh, yeah, there we go. There's a nice one. Okay, here's a female plant. You can see she's covered in fruits. The fruits look like a bunch of little, uh, well, just a bunch, couple orange slices all uh, welded together at the center, you know, affixed to the uh, the axis right there, and the little uh, pedestals and whatnot. Now there's a beetle that comes out here and I guess uh, preys on some of the seed, burrows into the seed, the larvae do, but, uh, you know, obviously it's got enough fruit, some of them make it out, but then you get to ask yourself, what disperses this, you know, and that's where it comes in, it's been theorized that some of these uh, some of these fruits must have been dispersed by some of the now extinct Pleistocene megafauna, you know, which is, you know, they say the same thing about Osage Orange Maclura, the genus Maclura, which you get in the Midwest, East, and the Southeast, same thing. Pretty interesting, you know, it's an interesting theory, but again, there's not really any way to know, you know, could it be a, a cave bear or a sloth or something that, uh, that was doing, you know, doing a goods here? 
Pack rats might disperse it a little bit too. I know the pack rats use some of the shoots for their nesting with this shit. You know, I guess they probably just make sure those those uh, stems are pointing out. But uh, you know, and then of course say uh, the pack rats use them for the nest and then uh, encrust everything with a nice patina of urine. And then of course say uh, you know some uh, uh, some uh, paleontologist digs it up fifteen thousand years later. You can tell what was growing in the area that doesn't grow there no more. Like uh, you know, like they've done with this, some of the pinion juniper. They said they found it. Pinion juniper used to grow a lot lower, okay? You know, but when the climate, that's how we know the climate was different. But now they're restricted to the higher elevation mountain ranges in the Mojave Desert. Anyway, look at this nice, uh, look at that nice canescence. That velvety texture. Oh, yeah. That's pretty nice, huh? Keeps that uh, stem, that stem temperature low so it can uh, keep uh, doing photosynthesis. Reflects a lot of that UV light. As well as the generally uh, uh, lighter, uh, bluer color of the stem tissue as well. Again, photosynthetic stems only got leaves on them when they're young. I seen uh, at the population south of here, southwest of here, in eastern San Diego County, I seen a, I seen a bunch of seedlings. I ain't seen no recruitment yet here, not here. But see, these are these are old fruits too. And I've actually I've germinated these before. And the thing I did because they they seem to need some treatment is I just took the actual, you know, each one of those is a little seed, and I just took the seeds put them in my mouth and just chewed on them for a little bit you know kind of scraped off uh, that uh, epidermal uh, tissue on the uh, on the seed just chewed on the seed a little bit and I got a, I got some good work I got a couple seedlings I got like five or six you know but they're not gonna grow good for me that you know in Oakland so either eat or give them to the botanic garden or maybe you know put them at a, a friend's house uh, who lives uh, you know either in a Eastern Nevada, Southern Nevada, or uh, Eastern Mojave, you know. Got to find a friend to do, let me let me throw it on their land. Anyway, there you go, Castilla Moriai, wonderful plant. You know, and this population doesn't seem to be too big. Less than 100 individuals for sure, just scattered amongst the creosote bush. Yeah, there you go, there's a the little guy, little seedling. He's still got his leaves on him. But you can see these spines, you know, give it another few years, those leaves will be gone. This will just be a, a semblance of spines. Just shoots covered in spines. Got another seedling right there. Now I've seen there's another species of Castilla. I've seen one in Mexico. I've seen one in a deep south Texas. I believe there's only seven, seven or eight species in the genus. Another female right there. It's amazing how quickly all this dries up. Oh, yeah, look, here's another seedling. This guy's probably five or six years old, growing at the base of an uh, ancient creosote that seems on the verge of death. You can tell that must be really old, because look where the roots, uh, look where the, the ground level is at the base of this plant, this creosote plant. It's about two feet higher than the basin that we're in. Still got little, still got a couple little leaves on them. Right there. So, again, these are relatively easy to germinate. You just got to masticate them. You just got to chew on them a little bit. Not too hard. Don't crack them open, you know. Just lightly chew on them, you know, probably, uh, probably uh, just, you know, I've heard you could do the same thing with some juniper seeds. You got to just put them in your mouth for 20 minutes, lightly chew on them. Don't break them up, but just, you know, enough to crack the seed coat a little bit, you know. Works as good as scarification with the sandpaper or something. Then you sow the seed, they come up, you know, in a month or two, but you're not going to have any luck growing these outside unless you, you live in a, a place where it gets very hot, okay, very hot outside. You know, i.e. South Texas, Arizona, Mojave Desert, etc. You need that heat. You know, and it's mostly, you need that heat mostly because of the metabolism. Plants that are adapted to grow in a very hot environments, okay, their metabolic requirements require a much warmer temperature. Same thing why you can't grow shit that's from an alpine cold environment, uh, you know, in a hotter temperature. It's all about the metabolism. And then it gets real weird when you go to the New World Tropics, okay, and you get, uh, you know, uh, high elevation, but you're at the equator, all right? Then it gets real weird because it gets cold as hell up at 11,000 feet, say, Columbia or something. But then, uh, you know, you're still getting, it gets really hot during the day. So you get those really weird temperature fluctuations between night and day. Good luck trying to grow any of that shit in a, a temperate climate. Jack, what are you, what are you thinking about over there, huh? What are you thinking about? You're thinking about how much I love you, huh? No, I don't think you are. I think you're probably thinking about how a meatless Monday needs to stop being a thing. I'm going to take you to Sizzler later, huh? I'll get you in to see your service, though. You hang out under the table. I'll slip you little scraps of what the shit. Oh, yeah. Look at it. 
That's pretty nice, huh? Oh, God. Doesn't that make you feel a little bit less like you want to go find a luxury automobile and put a couple half racks of rotten shrimp and lunch meat inside, huh? Look at that. Langlosima. Langlosima. Cetacissima. Polymoniaceae is the family. Flax family. One of the desert calicos. You can see that uh, you got those blue anthers, those blue uh, blue anthers just full of pollen in the middle. And then on the right, that right flower, it's already in a female phase. You get the uh, the pistil out. Got a tree-lobed stigma over there. and they're, uh, So they're functionally male first. They're functionally staminate. And then they go into the female phase. You can see over here. See that guy still got, he still got the, the, the stamens. Okay, the anthers have turned white there. The stamen's all around, but he, now he's in a, he's receptive to pollen. So functionally male first, then they go female. This guy's still functional. Beautiful, beautiful goddamn plant. Look at it. Those anthers are incredible. Look at it, sky blue, huh? There's one that didn't go off yet. Just tiny little annuals. Tons of cool little annuals in a flox family, Polymoniaceae. Anyway, that's all I got for you today. I hope you have a good uh, rest of your day. Good rest of your afternoon. Uh, be nice to each other. Wash your hands. Wash your hands. Bye. Look at it. Echinocactus polycephalus keeps its goddamn fruits, okay, most of which are duds, most of which are not good. But there's a good one. See the little black seeds? It keeps its fruits behind the cavalcade of spines, in a little cage of spines. So what is supposed to disperse that, huh? Some sort of bird? I'd assume it's some kind of bird. I don't even think a pet rat could get in there. Maybe a pet rat. But certainly a jackass with a letterman can. So I'm going to take these seeds, and I'm going to just uh, go ahead, you know, dispersing them, sowing them and what the shit, inside the little nooks and crannies of the rocks up there. Nice.